Good evening, and welcome to Galesburg Nazarene. This is uh, Wednesday night, June 30th, the last day of June in uh, 2021, and tomorrow's July 1st. Uh, we're heading into the holiday weekend of the 4th of July, Independence Day. So we welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study and our prayer time, and we welcome those who are at home or wherever you're watching online. We appreciate you paying attention and, and being a part of our services, and um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the safety and the protection that you give to us as we travel to and fro, and as you help us to fulfill the work that you have for us. Lord, we praise you that you grace us with your word, fill our hearts with your wisdom and knowledge as we learn from you, and I pray, God, that you would bless our time together tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, uh, we, all, we have been working on the series of churches in the book of Revelation, and last week, uh, we have kind of three or four into this session, and tonight, we're talking about the church at Thyatira. Uh, a little bit of background information before we actually get into the scripture, but we will be in Revelations chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. But the little bit of background is um, Thyatira is situated between Pergamos and Sardis, uh, a little off the main road, which connected these two cities. Uh, it was a Macedonian colony founded by Al Alexander the Great um, after the overthrow of the Persian Empire. And the Macedonian colonists appear to have introduced the worship of Apollo, uh, honored as the sun god under the name of Ty Tyrimnus. It has been thought that by some that the description here given of Christ, when we get into the scripture, we'll look at it, the eyes of flame, was selected in allusion to this worship of the sun god under the form of some dazzling ornamental image. Uh, there seems to be uh, various merchant guilds, and today we would call them unions, as uh, in the colony, bakers, potters, tanners, weavers, and dyers. Uh, the dye trade was perhaps the most important and obviously, as we look in the book of Acts, we see Lydia, uh, who was the seller of purple, who was in all likelihood connected with the guild of dyers. And her appearance in Philippi is an illustration of the trade relations of Macedonia and Thyatira. Um, and they believe that the Christian community in Thyatira was the result of Lydia. Uh, and so it's interesting to see how God used the spread of the gospel in the book of Acts and how those seeds grew up into churches. And we see these churches as they played out in the late, late first century uh, of, uh, in, the, in the year A.D. So let's look at the scripture. We're going to read it in its entirety, then we're going to break it down. This is Revelations chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. And I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I like that opening verse. 
um, when they described Jesus. Obviously, earlier in the book of Revelations, they described him this way. We also look in the book of Daniel, and there's the exact same description. Uh, Daniel had a vision of Christ, and so did the apostle John. And John, who probably was very familiar with the book of Daniel, uh, as he was writing and experiencing this vision of Revelation, um, you have to wonder if John was thinking, well, I, I wonder if this is what Daniel saw too. Uh, but anyway, uh, I like what the commentator says, and, and actually the commentator referred to the book of Daniel and the commentary that they had about Daniel's. And so these verses are nearly identical, but this is what it says in Daniel 10, chapter 5. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and a voice like the sound of a multitude. And uh, John also describes that same voice coming in earlier in the book of Revelation. And Gill's exposition of the Bible expounds on this imagery in these two, le two nearly identical verses. His eyes as lamps of fire, denoting his omniscience of all persons and things, and how piercing and penetrating his eyes are into the affairs of people and countries by whom they are clearly seen and to whom they are exactly known, and how fierce and terrible his wrath is toward his enemies and who look, whose looks must inject dread and terror into them. His arms and his feet, like in color to polished brass, denoting his great strength for action, his stability and firmness, and glory of his, in his power, in trampling upon his enemies and subduing them, especially as displayed in the redemption of his people, when his own arm wrought salvation for them, and when he accomplished an entire victory over sin, Satan, and the world, under whose feet they are and ever will be subject. I, I, I couldn't do any better than that, so that's the reason why I copied out of it. I love that the, the description that it has that, you know, this is the mighty Christ. Uh, one thing that I appreciate about these addresses to the different churches is that Jesus is described differently uh, and these various descriptions are not to point out that Jesus is a different person or a different God. Uh, but each situation is revealing another characteristic, another attribute of an infinite and all-powerful God. Each church situation is nestled within a tainted community. And it reveals just another aspect of God's ability to overcome evil. Uh, as the opening dialogue mentioned that Apollo, the sun god, was supposedly the reigning god for this region. Uh, but this demonic ruler, Apollo, is no comparison to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And during that day and age, the different countries and different regions believed that they had a god, and many of them had several gods for the region. And if you appease these entities, and you know, of course there wasn't, there wasn't that idea that there was a loving god, you, you had a brutal God, and he would take care of you if you did the, the, the demeaning things that he expected of you, and some of those were sacrificing children and things like that. But you had to appease an angry God. Uh, and if they did appease an angry God for the region, that they would have success and defeat their enemies. So there was always this, the gods of the different regions were warring against each other, there was never any peace. There was never any love. And for us to make this contrast here that this is a mighty God that could conquer everything. Uh, you know, we think about when the apostles were going across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus was sleeping. And they were disturbed about it. And they woke Jesus up and Jesus calmed the sea. And, and they were amazed that Jesus could calm the sea. This the, the winds and waves obey uh, Jesus. And, you know, we don't think about it in terms of our culture and day because we don't think about these regional, uh, somewhat uh, magical gods that did these things. But back then, that was very much how people thought. They put a lot of stock into these regional uh, idols and gods that they did. And really what they were was demonic beings that held sway over them. Uh, but... It was hard, even though they understood that God was all-powerful, they had to be constantly reminded that he was God over everything. 
uh, Jesus was mighty and powerful. And as we look through these different churches in the book of Revelation, we see how every evil aspect, and as we delve into the rest of the churches, that there, there's nothing that evil can throw at God, that he doesn't have an aspect or an attribute to quash that evil or that, that um, insidious nature of how Satan raises up and causes issues. So Jesus, once again, and I like this about Jesus when he's talking to the churches, he begins by praising that church. He points out what they do well. We should also take note of that when we're dealing with other people. You know, we should always look for the good in people. We should always encourage them. We should always have that ability to point out what's positive in people's lives. Uh, Jesus said this church is noted for the love and faith, their service and perseverance. Uh, this is actually, in some translations, says they're noted for their charity. And we sometimes get lost on that word. We, we, we kind of differentiate today between love and charities. We give to charities. Uh, but really the whole concept behind agape love is charity and giving to other people. Uh, so, But this is agape love in action. And Jesus says, I know your deeds. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 18, but some will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Uh, Jesus also said in Matthew that by their fruit you would recognize them. A good tree will bear good fruit. This family of believers was known for their deeds, of their love toward others, their acts of service. Sometimes, something about faith and perseverance also translated as patience. When you hear the word perseverance, it can also be translated as being patient. As believers... We sow seeds, not knowing the final outcome. We sow these seeds in faith, knowing that over time some will bear fruit. And Jesus illustrated this in the parable of the sower. Not all seed, seed will ultimately bear fruit. In the parable, it was easy for Jesus to delineate and show that there's different, ty different types of soils. Some was on the path, some on the rocky soil, some fell on good soil. And it's easy... You know, if you're a gardener, you you understand that there's going to be different seeds, and they're going to they're going to sow, they're going to grow at different things. And it's kind of funny at City Hall, where I work, they um, did some sidewalk work, and they tore up some ground and stuff, and they were planting uh, grass seed along the where they tore it all up. But the funny thing is, there was some soil that kind of fell on the sidewalk, and some grass seed fell there, and the grass started growing, <laughs> growing up there, and I was thinking as I was coming out of work the other night, I'm thinking, well, I know what's going to happen to that grass because it doesn't have much root, and the sun's going to come down on it, and it's going to burn up. And actually, it reminded me of the sower, the sower parable, but that's exactly true. That would be the rocky soil. It doesn't have place to grow depth. It doesn't have a... But see, in real life, we don't know that. We don't know... A lot of times, we, we shouldn't know. We shouldn't make an assumption, well, I'm not going to sow seed here because that person's hard-hearted. Or I, I'm gonna, I can't sow seed, that person's busy. We don't know the hearts of people. But we do know, though, and this says this in Ecclesiastics 11.6, Sow your seed in the morning, and in, even, and in the evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that or whether both will do equally well. So this church was good in sowing seeds through their service, knowing in faith that some would bear fruit. So we don't, we don't get to pick and choose where we sow the seed. We sow the seed, and God, you know, Apollo planted, Paul watered, you know, or how is it the other way around, Paul planted and Apollo watered. It doesn't really matter who plants and who waters. It's God that makes the seed grow. And I, sometimes... We can read people. I, you know, I, I, I think as we get older, we can say, well, I, I'm a pretty good judge of character. Um, but we all fall short. We, can't, we don't know where that seed will fall. And sometimes I think that when we allow ourselves to get caught up in trying to make that judgment, we, we, we fail. So we need to be diligent as a church sowing seed as we have opportunity. And then that seed will bear fruit. But this church was good at that. They were very good at sowing the seed. They were bearing fruit. 
So I was got to thinking, what does a church dedicated to the service of others look like today? Uh, not every church will have all the same ministries, but each can still fulfill the calling or service that God desires for their particular congregation. Some of that has to do with the talents and gifts of those who attend that church. And some of it has to do with the cultural needs of the surrounding community. Think about it. We have needs in the community. We have people with talents and gifts inside the church. Now, one of the things that I've learned is that I think I know what my talents and gifts are because of my past experience, and I can count on that. But there's times where God has put me in situations that I didn't think would work. And come to find out there's a gift or a talent I have that I didn't think would work in that particular situation, but because it fulfilled the need and it did what it did, God was able to use me and I learned something new about myself. So when we look about how our church should address issues in, the, in our culture, in our community, we shouldn't keep, we, we shouldn't have that rigid mindset that, well, you know, I've always taught junior high. I'm always going to teach junior high because that's where my gifts and abilities are. Now, there's also been times where I've done things that I thought, well, I'll give this a good try. And I filled a need for a while. And that's all it was, was I filled a need for a while and I didn't feel particularly gifted, but God used me in that particular situation. So sometimes that's what happens too in our churches that we fill a need because there's no one else that will. But what I do know is that Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37 through 38, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So what are the needs of the Galesburg area, and how can our body of believers help meet those needs? It's good to know that the Thyatira Church was doing what it was supposed to be doing, and Jesus said doing more than it was doing at first. They were expanding their ministries. They were doing good things in service and in, in charity to their community. And I always believe that if we're doing and following God's will, there will be growth there. God will bless when, when we were obedient to him and what we're doing. So this is what was doing, this was what was going well in Thyatira. They were, they were meeting the needs of the people in their community. However, it doesn't take very long for Jesus to get to the correction part. Um, this part is necessary because eternal destinies are on the line, and we have a wolf in sheep's clothing working in this church. Verse 20 says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate, didn't say approve, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating the food sacrificed to idols. Now, most obviously, this woman's name was probably not Jezebel. Uh, but Jesus is making a comparison here, saying this person is just like the most wicked woman in the Old Testament who seduced the Israelites into idol worship. Um, and actually, today in our culture, we use the word, she's a Jezebel, or they're a Jezebel, or it's a Jezebel spirit. Uh, it's not a compliment by any stretch of the imagination. And the problem wasn't that she was a woman. But her teaching was deceptive. Now, the word that they have here is, is translated mislead. Other translations say seduced. When I went back to the Greek word meaning, it means to wander. Uh, they wandered away from the truth. Um, this admonition sounds rather stark. But I have a feeling if the root word means to wander, that her actions were subtle. It's possible these church members may have thought her teaching a bit unconventional, but harmless. And Jesus is setting the record straight here. Her teaching is very dangerous. We don't know what she was teaching, and uh, we don't know what she was doing to lead these people into sexual immorality. It could have been several things. But diluting the truth always leads people astray. Diluting the truth. Misleading people astray doesn't come from a frontal attack. Last week we talked about subtle side attacks. And so we, we have to be careful. You know, I, I remember one time somebody was talking about drinking a glass of water. And if we just put just a little bit of dirt in it, 
you want to drink it? No. You know, we don't dilute the truth. Um, but skipping to verse 24, we'll go back to those other verses here. But now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, we may learn a little bit about what the lure of her teaching was. Jesus calls it the so-called deep secrets of Satan, but that's probably not what she called it, okay? This is what Jesus is calling them, because remember last week he was calling Zeus Satan? Okay, they call it something different. She was probably setting up some kind of a little group with privileged information about the deep secrets of God. And I'm going to put that in parentheses. We may even make it a small g because it really wasn't the real God. And do we do that today? Well, I guess we can. Um, as we talked before, there are teachers who believe that their inter interpretations of the word are necessary for others to believe on their behalf. I, you need me as your teacher to help me na you navigate through your Christian walk. Nothing wrong with having a mentor, but the mentor is not the Holy Spirit. We don't need a, a third-party Holy Spirit in the body. We have the Holy Spirit within us. Um, maybe she had a time that she met with a group of people outside of normal church time and invited gullible or susceptible people. But the sin was here. Obviously, her sin was that she was leading it astray, but Jesus is correcting the church here, not necessarily the woman he calls Jezebel. So... What she was doing is that she was infiltrating and, and, and drawing away and destroying this bond in this church. And the others didn't think anything about it, but they should have. Okay, She was using the church as a means to draw these people and have some little exclusive group going on. And the leaders in the church allowed it to happen. Going on in verse 21, 22, and 23, I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Unless they repent of her ways, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now Jesus, who knows all our hearts, lays down exactly what's going to happen to this person. He doesn't mince words. He points out that he already has provided an opportunity for her repent. He is fair and just. We know the Holy Spirit has been working on her heart, but guess what? It says right here, she is unwilling. This is not a confused person or a misdirected person, but rather a willful person bent on their own selfish will. But Jesus is not willing to allow this evil seduction to continue. He's given her opportunity to repent. He, in his kindness and his gentleness, he was trying to get her to repent, but he could not stand it any longer. The punishment for this willful behavior is threefold. She will suffer. Those who partake in the teachings will suffer intensely, and God will strike her children dead. Now, this punishment seems rather harsh, but many sinful behaviors have their own dreaded consequences, especially sexual immorality. Back then, those who participated in this type of behavior often had transmitted diseases that brought about suffering, even death. Now, today, mo today's modern medicine often uh, softens this blow with readily available antibiotics and antivirals. We can, we can take away the, the, the physical consequences However, we can't take away the scourge that sexual immorality and rebellion uh, brings to our mind and our soul, though. We can go to the doctor and get some antibiotics, but until we go to Jesus and receive the healing for that rebellion, that willfulness in our heart and our mind, that, that, those, that brokenness stays. Uh, the term children here can refer to either both her biological children or those who adhere, the adherence to her teaching, the, the commentators were kind of split. They don't know. It could be either. It could be both. Um, and even though this punishment may seem extreme, Jesus is declaring here just how dangerous this line of teaching is. The end of these followers has more to do with the protecting of others and keeping them from being corrupted. 
he didn't want Jezebel, this Jezebel lady. He wanted her to repent. He also wanted these others to repent. But when they're unwilling, he, he then is about protecting his church. God will not allow his name to be profane, and he will not all allow his children to be sacrificed for one who is not willing to repent. The last part of verse 24 and 5, 25, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what I ha you have until I come. Now, Jesus clearly, uh, this is a burden, is clearly saying it will be a burden for this church to remove this heresy. Taking steps to remove someone who has a popular following is not ever easy. It takes personal and group prayer, fasting, coming together to discuss, acts of repentance separately and together as a body of believers, a remolding of this body of Christ to obedience and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. You have to understand that they did not become, they didn't allow this Jezebel to be in their midst because they were really being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They got lazy. They took their church sanctity for granted. And they tolerated this woman. Walking in fellowship together as a church takes purposeful action together. Having a healthy church does not automatically happen. Just like having a healthy body doesn't automatically happen. I can eat donuts and... and uh, never exercise and never eat anything healthy. And if I had a healthy body and did take care of it, that would kind of more be the accident rather than the rule. But if you're going to stay healthy, you're going to have to do what your doctor tells you to do. You have to eat right. You have to stay active. And then that's the way it is with the church body. We have to do the healthy things that church families should do. It takes all the parts of the body working together in harmony to develop healthy interactions and active discernment to protect against the wolves in sheep clothing or any other wayward attempt at misleading ideas. And I, I think as I, I think that we struggle in our churches with the idea that we don't want to offend anybody. And maybe that's what they struggled with. Maybe they struggled with this concept that, I don't want to offend maybe someone new in Christ because they want to do this, or I don't want to say something that would discourage somebody. But God gifts us all. And one of the gifts that God blesses the church with is the gift of discernment. Now, the gift of discernment is that ability to instantly understand that something is not quite right. Not everybody will have that gift. Some will. And I think it's Jesus had the gift of discernment. Jesus had all the gifts. So, but we as body believers, that's one of the things that we have to recognize. Who in our church has that gift of discernment? Obviously, there's some people that have the gift of teaching, and some people have the gift of encouragement. Some people have the gift of administration. But it's so important for us to respect the people who have the gift of discernment. I think quite often what ends up happening is these people who have the gift of discernment get kicked around because, well, I know so-and-so. They would never do that. You know, I think we need to be very careful. And, and we, we, we can use our gifts what can be in a seemingly selfish or spiteful manner. But I think that as I've seen in the many different churches that I've been in, People who have the gift of discernment get kicked around a lot because other people think, well, I don't think that about that person. And there's never anything wrong with being cautious. Obviously, the church in Thyatira either didn't take those people in their church who had the gift of discernment seriously, but they suffered for it. They had a burden put on them because they didn't allow the Holy Spirit to use and develop the people in the church that had the gift of discernment. And I think if you look, we talked last week about side, side getting hit on the side, that the, the people did not, the Pergamon church did not take a frontal attack, but they ended up taking falling from a side attack. 
Satan specializes in subtleties. And if we don't respect those people in the church that have all those different gifts, then we, th we're we going to suffer for it. And I don't, and I, you know, I'm not saying that maybe some people are going to go to hell that shouldn't go to hell. God is gracious. But at the same time, what were they doing right? They were serving the community. And maybe, just maybe, if they had made more, paid more attention to what they should have been doing and keeping their house clean, their service could have been even greater. When, when we're obedient and in line with God, he fills us and we become a conduit for his love and his protection. But Jesus doesn't say that, but I, it, I, that's my admonition here is that we, we have to be obedient to what God calls us to do. And if it means sometimes maybe making some hard decisions about things and maybe, you know, well, let's pray about it. Let's pray together as a church. Let's pray together as a board. Let's pray together as a group. God never gets in a hurry. And if we as a church, if something is important, he will bless us and he will work that, that ministry into our church. And then finally, in, in the verses 26 through uh, 29, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this end encouragement also takes a blow at the fake teaching that has been taught in this church. Uh, those who follow the secrets of Satan... And we don't know exactly what their secrets were. And like I said before, they didn't probably, this lady didn't probably describe them as secrets of Satan. Uh, but often Satan tempts humanity with shortcuts to power and control. And, but this is a very false sense of control, though. But in, the, but in the seed of sin or the beginning stages of sin, there is a need to control. And then from that need to control springs rebellion. Satan fills our heads with lies about God. If he really loved us, he would let us enjoy the things of life in this world. He would allow us to have control over this situation. Because I'm a Christian, I should have control over the situation, and these other people are unbelievers. But that's not, you know, that's Satan's way. He wants us to take those shortcuts. He wants us to take matters into our own hands. Uh, he also our own brokenness he tries to tell us that there are ways that we can resolve all our brokenness and that we can't trust in God's patience and working and healing in our life I guess the attitude comes down to I will not release control of my life but Jesus says here whoever does his will to the end will receive this authority this control so here it's not about God saying you can never have control. It said that there's going to be a time when he gives us. God is not unkind to limit us in this world. Satan wants to tell us that, that God is holding out on us. Isn't that what he said to Eve? He's holding out. But God knows all too well that we would be sorely tempted to wield whatever power we have to do evil. And that is exactly what happens if we don't submit to God. However, this lack of submission does not give true control. It only leads us into spiritual bondage. And in the case of Jezebel, suffering and death. It will be amazing to hold true to the end. And we will share in that authority with Jesus. Jesus said, hold on. Hang on. Do what you know to do. And in the end, we will share in that authority with Jesus. We must be patient because in due season, we will reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, Jesus is referred to as the morning star in Scripture. And in this particular set, said that we will give one that we, we will get the morning star. This comparison is based upon the planet Venus that is often seen in the early morning twilight. And this bright and morning star represent Jesus' is coming to save us. While it's still dark, we have the promise of the morning star that darkness is nearly over. 
when we receive the gift of Jesus, who will have the final authority. And it is great, God's great love for us that compels Jesus to hold the wicked accountable. I like this, this church. I, I like that they did acts of service. I appreciate that Jesus admonished them to clean house. And that's important for us to clean our own house. To, what are we tolerating in our own hearts? What are we allowing? What false lies are we allowing us? And what is preventing us from being more of a servant to those around us? And also to challenge us in our church and what we're doing to be of greater service to our community and greater service to those people around us in need. I also know that whatever God calls us to do, he enables us to do this. He's, it is him that works in us to accomplish his will and purpose. And so um, I'm excited. I, I go and enjoy going through this. And so that's the, the Thyatira. There's a lot more I could have talked about, but um, I don't have time. But I just encourage you to continue your studies and, and see all these wonderful things. It's time for our prayer time. Uh, we have our uh prayer requests, and most of them are the same, but we have a few new ones. Uh, Blaine and Wilda's son-in-law uh, had some surgery, but he experienced a small stroke. We need to pray for them, and they went to visit with him. Ken Swanson is having some surgery. We need to pray for him. Uh, Virginia Peachy's recuperating from an uh, extensive cold. And then a pastor in the Nazarene church, his name's Jared Henry, had a uh, Surgery and had many can uh, cancerous tumors removed. We need to pray for him. Oh, we need to continue to remember um, the people who have lost loved ones. Randy Reed, who's normally here, uh, is having some health issues and some personal issues. And then, of course, Sterling England is in the hospital with some tests. And so uh, just continue to remember the people who are uh, have cancer and health issues who are unable to be here. Uh, personal issues and things like that. Um, are there any other prayer requests before we pray tonight? Laura? Okay. Laura's daughter, Sarah. Okay. Her life situation just needs, she needs to Just need to pray for our church as we transition with some leaders, um, as we also uh, reopen. As, as we just need people in all our different ministries. Uh, so if, ask, ask God to open your heart to uh, what he may want you to do. We always appreciate. I, I, we should praise God for what he does and the, and the workers. And, you know, but like I had in there, God said, Jesus said the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we need to pray for God to send workers. And uh, I think if we pray for it, God will bring them. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the precious promises that you give us, that you are going to be with us, and that you encourage us to hold tight to the end, that you are going to give us that grace and that mercy to live, that it is you who works in us. We praise you that you comfort us in our sorrows, and Lord, we lift up people who have lost loved ones. We think of the Oliver family, and we also think of the Brady family, and both have lost close loved ones that you continue to bring healing to their lives, and we praise you for that. Lord, we pray that you would be with um, Sterling, who is in the hospital. We pray that you'd be near him, work through the doctors with their tests, that you they would find what they need to do in the corrective action. We pray that you would be with Blaine and Wilda's son-in-law, who's in this situation with a stroke, that you would bring healing to him and help him in their situation. Pray that you would be with Kent Swanson and his surgery coming up, that you would work through that, that you would protect him. Lord, we pray that you continue to bring healing to Virginia Peachy and her health situation. And we also lift up Jared Henry as he's had cancer surgery, that you're going to continue to heal him. Lord, we pray that you be with Randy. Uh, he's usually here tonight. Lord, we pray that you would um, help him and his
personal and health issues, encourage him. We pray that you'd be with Laura's daughter, Sarah, and her life situation, Lord, that you would help her to turn things around and to trust you. Lord, we lift up Monica uh, Malhus, who's going to be having uh, surgery to remove skin cancer. We pray, Lord, that you would work in that situation and, and uh, just help her to trust you. And we pray that you would protect her. Lord, we pray that you would be with um, Lisa Strong's sister, Cindy Happ, who has had a tumor removed, that she has brain cancer, that you would be in her treatment. We also pray that you would be with Vicki Gleason's sister-in-law, Cheryl, who continues to have lung problems, that you're going to work in her life. We pray that you would be with uh, all the many people who have health issues. Lord, we lift them up to you. You know each and every one of their needs. Lord, we, uh, we lift these people up. Benjamin Dragu, Barb Hoxima. Lord, we pray that you would be with Clinton Masters, Carol Knott, Joanne Howerton, Bill Stone, Paula Rand, Patty Johnson, Marcia Duke, Gary Liebarger, Gary Barkman, Jennifer Brown. All these people have health issues, God, and you know each and every one of their needs. Lord, we pray that you would just touch and anoint them, help them in their uh, particular situation, that you would uh, comfort them and they would know and feel your presence, that they would be drawn close to you. Lord, we pray that you would be with Fran Newton's sister, Karen Williams, who's recovering from major surgery. And Lord, we also pray that you would be with uh, Roger Roberts, uh, who's having some heart tests, and also pray for Bill Burford, who's having some health issues. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've worked in Dennis Sprague's life. And but Lord, I pray that you would help him to deal with uh, the side effects of chemo and the compression fractures, that you would just encourage him, Lord. We praise you that he was at church on Sunday. We praise you, God, that you're working in Laura's friends, Kathy's life, who is recovering from surgery. We, we're so thankful that you're working in the Gonzalez family, help them to continue to heal in their issues. Lord, we lift up Raleigh and Bonnie and their family, their son Luke and their grandson Daniel and also for an unspoken request, Lord. We thank you for their service to our church and you would be in their family's needs. Father, we pray you continue to be with Katie Haynes and her mother, Mary uh, Ruth Meyer, Lord, as they continue to work with this diagnosis of ALS, Lord, that you would give them peace. Lord, we pray that you continue to support and encourage Lori Cameron as she takes care uh, and as she continues to heal from the loss of her husband. But Lord, we pray that you be with George Fitzpatrick and his healing, that you would be with him, him and his wife as they navigate through this recovering from a stroke. Continue to work in their life and be close to them. Lord, we pray that you continue to be with Isla Liebarger, that you would help with this child and their extreme health issues, that you would provide for this family financially. And we pray that you would encourage them. Lord, we pray for the host of people who have cancer. We lift them up to you, Lord. We pray you provide for them financially, calm their spirit, help them as they navigate through treatments and through not feeling well and headaches and all those things that you would comfort them in their time. Lord, we specifically lift up Bob Spears, Mike Kone, Rose, Stella McDorman, Bill Pettigo, Ann, Ginger, Pat Taylor, Ed Clapp, Morris Stewart, Sylvia Stone, Todd Clickage, Roseanne, Vicki Banks, and Terry Hammond. Lord, each and every one of these people has specific cancer needs. Lord, we know that you're a God of healing, and you can work through the doctors, through medicine, and through supernatural ways to he touch and heal their bodies. And Lord, we praise you for the work that you're doing in each and every one of these people's lives. Lord, I lift up our church to you, Lord. I praise you for this church building. I praise you that we have the means to, to pay the bills, to be here. We praise you, God, that we rely on you for that. But, Lord, more importantly, I thank you for the body of believers that this church represents. Lord, I thank you for the way that you touch and anoint each person. Lord, that it's about obedience to you. And, Lord, that we don't need to have fantastic uh, things, Lord, you just, because you are made, 
you're glorified through our weakness. I pray, God, that you would help each of us to be submitted to you, to be humble before you, to honor you in our lives, to wake up in the morning and, and submit ourselves to you. I praise you, God, that you are working in our lives to be stars in the universe to impact this community. And, Lord, it, you have a way of working through us that we don't even understand, but, Lord, we trust you that as we pass on acts of service, Lord, that you are in each and every one of those, that you work through our acts of service. And, Lord, we don't even have to think about it, but, Lord, that you are there filling those needs. Lord, I pray that you would help our community. Lord, there's such deep need in our community, people that are hurt, they're broken, they're abusing drugs, and they are confused. And Satan has them so disoriented that they are bound but, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray through our witness, our examples, through our prayers, Lord, that we would release these people in the name of Jesus from the bondage of drug abuse, bondage of brokenness, bondage of abuse as children, Lord, that you would give them that ability that they can be free to choose Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And, Lord, as you open up their minds and their hearts, Lord, that we would be right there, that we would be in keep moments, Lord, that we could speak Jesus to them with a cup of cold water, with a box of food, with a word of encouragement, Lord, helping them through the temptations and the trials of life, Lord. This is where we are. Help us to meet and connect with people in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would put that burden on each and every one of our hearts. Put people on our hearts, Lord. And Lord, as our prayers go before you, Lord, as we lay claim to their the, the legal authority to dedicate those people and, and for them to come to know you, Lord, that you will bring people into their lives. Maybe it's not us. Maybe someone else in another community. Maybe somebody comes up. And Lord, we pray that we would be with faithful to pray for these people. But Lord, I pray as other people are prayed for that we don't even know about as they touch our lives, that we are obedient, that we say the things, we do the things, Lord, that will key them in, that they would say, I want what that person has. And Lord, I pray that the saveryness of Jesus Christ burns through our lives and that people will be drawn to others because of how we live our life, not in, per not in per perfection, God, but in love, but in that love that shows that other people matter and I pray God that we would get ourselves out of the way that we would submit ourselves and die to ourselves and allow you to put your seed and we would grow you would grow through us and Lord as that that fruit develops in our life Lord that people would be hungry for us and Lord we know that the things that this world gives Lord it is destroys and eats away at us and I pray against those lies in the name of Jesus Christ and I pray that the truth of God would be in the hearts of people and Lord I pray that church is open on Sunday and every other moment that every ministry opportunity that we have Lord that it would be an impactful for you that we would build your kingdom that you would be there in everything that we're doing Lord to bring glory and honor to you Lord we thank you God that as we trust you and that you enable us Lord you will give us the means you will give us the finances you will give us the people you will give us the words to say to draw people's hearts to you Lord because that is what it's all about it's about building building your kingdom and drawing people to you because Lord it's a celebration and we're going to celebrate here and we're going to celebrate in heaven and God we just want we want that power we want that blessing to flow through us so that people can know that Jesus Christ loves them that Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life and that any other way falls short and it hurts and and Lord we just praise you for all that you're doing in our church we pray that you would bless our pastors and their and, and the other staff and the teachers and all the different ministries, Lord, as we work together as the body of Christ, Lord, to bring, to bring blessing and honor to you in everything that we do. And, Lord, we ask you to be with us as we go out, that you would come back Sunday morning, that we would be filled with your blessings, Lord, to bring glory and honor to you. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious holy name. Amen.